So welcome everyone to another one of our Business Launch Cafes this week. And as you know, every week we introduce you to another leading entrepreneur around the globe. And it's really my pleasure and honor to meet a good old friend, Eric Meads today. It's great to have you, Eric, with us. Good to be here. Great. And Eric, I mean, you, like I, you know, and a lot of people that are watching us, we are all wholehearted entrepreneurs, but you're really a serial entrepreneur, right? When you have started, you you know, you started actually and, uh, and bought and sold companies in an impressive range of industries, including mobile technology, medical simulation, event management, 3D camera engineering, and even Hollywood special effects, right? And I know that your companies even worked on blockbuster movies, including the one and only that we all loved, you know, groundbreaking avatar of James Cameron and other great films like the Iron Man, Transformers, and the Pirates of the Caribbean, and you know, a lot of other films, right? And you're also a world-class speaker and one of our leading business and marketing mentors. And you've spoken to and consulted business owners in more than 20 countries. And what I find pretty impressive is that you've logged an impressive 10,000 more hours on stage already, right? And the first time we met uh, at the Light of, Light of Fire in Hamburg, You've shared the stage with Sir Richard Branson, and you're regularly sharing the stage with other top speakers and leaders like Anthony Robbins and former U.S. President Bill Clinton. And now in November, we'll meet again at Elevate, the biggest three-day life and business transformational event in Scandinavia. And we'll say more about that at the end of our interview, right? So let's sure. get started, Eric. Eric, that was a pretty long introduction, right? <laughs> so... Most of our listeners are wholehearted entrepreneurs like you and me, and many are just starting out as well, and they're very curious to hear more about who you are, Eric. What would you say? Who is Eric at Meets? Well, you know, I guess I'm a fun seeker. You know, I, I, I really, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit hedonistic. I enjoy life and getting as I can from it. And, and I think that when I found uh, business, when I found entrepreneurship, I recognized that I'm entrepreneurship, at least in my, you know, feeling of the world is that it's a really great expression of freedom. Uh, the idea of, of having a job where someone else, might, you know, guiding my day-to-day -day existence or projects or deciding my fate and future wasn't as much fun for me as m me being able to, you know, uh, craft those things for myself. Uh, so mostly I'm just, I, you know, I just enjoy living a fun life. I, I, I get uh, turned on by projects that, uh, you know, ignite my curiosity and and um and i just seem to just i just sort of follow those passions and, and where they lead me great and one question that always comes up is have you always been an entrepreneur or what actually ignited this entrepreneurial fire apart from the fun searching and seeking uh, you know uh, approach that you are taking you know i i have a general belief that everyone is an entrepreneur and what i i know that there are different peoples with different levels of entrepreneurialism. You know, there are some people who are constantly thinking that way and other people who don't think that way very often. But even the act of, of going out and getting a job is an entrepreneurial undertaking. It's saying, hey, I'm going to go out there and sell myself or I'm going to sell my time. And that, that, that is an action-taking exercise, which is a form of entrepreneurship. Look, even somebody who spends their entire you know, month trying to figure out how to get more money out of the government without getting a job is an entrepreneurial undertaking. It's like taking action to move forward. So I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm making a little bit of light of this, but I do believe that everyone is ultimately somewhat entrepreneurial. And then the next distinction is, do they become a business owner or do they take their entrepreneurial spirit and make it bigger than themselves? And I, that really happened for me. I mean, I, I, I had my own little businesses and stuff even when I was a kid. I, I would sell, you know, I had lemonade stands. As cliched as that might be, when you're nine years old, you don't really know what a, what a cliche is. So I, I had my lemonade stands and I sold seashells on the front of our house. And I, I went around and, and I lived in a place that snowed quite a lot. So I would go around in the winter and make money snow, shoveling away snow and in fall and it was time to move their leaves for them. I mean, I, I was always inclined toward thinking, how can I add value because money flows toward value? And where I really made this shift into, let's say, the business ownership version of entrepreneurship was, uh, you know, in my sort of mid-20s where I had a significant disagreement with an employer of mine and one day just decided that my, my soul was worth more than the money they were paying. I just, I wanted to be in command of my own 
future. And, and so off I went and started my first business. And that's when I really, you know, in today's commonly accepted version of the word entrepreneur, that's when I really became a, a business owner and an entrepreneur. I, I fully agree and I resonate so much with what you're saying because even even though I grew up in Eastern Germany where we didn't really have like entrepreneurs, most people were state employed, right? And still before I was 18, I'd found three different ways of, you know, identifying what people want, giving it to them and, you know, yes, accepting money in return, right? So yeah. you, know, you and I, we, we understood probably pretty early, um, you know, how to how to serve other people and, you know, that's all what entrepreneurial spirit is about. I love it. So now tell us more about your first business after you stepped out of your job back then uh, in the situation you just described. What was that first business and how did you get it started and was it in the end successful? Yeah, it was successful. And, um, and you know, I guess I was kind of lucky to have my first real business work out well. You know, that's statistically not the way it works for most people. Um, and the way it happened was that um, I, I was working for an American company that I'd been involved in uh, in helping start up, and uh, or at least I should say past the startup stage. I was the first full time employee of the company, and um, after six or seven years working for that company, as I mentioned before, I just I, you know I, I came to a, a a time when it was best that my destiny was no longer tied to the destiny of the owner of that business, and and I left and. I found myself in a really awkward situation and that was that I was living at this point in England and I, my, my uh, um, residence in England was tied to my employment. And so I was kind of faced with this really bizarre situation that my ex-employer refused to pay me any of the money that they owed me. So I was kind of trapped. I couldn't like fly back to Canada. I didn't have the money for it. I was like, you know, I, I was really truly trapped in another country. It was kind of odd. And, uh, and I had a new wife and I had a baby on the way and I had a new dog and a car and a house and I was kind of like, what do I do now? And what happened in my case was that, I, you know, a client of mine, from my old uh, company called me and said, hey, can you help me with something? And I said, no, it's not, I'm not in that business anymore. Um, and they kept persisting and saying, look, you can just help me with this one deal. And in the meantime, I'm really contemplating what I want to do with my life. Um, and and uh, uh, in the end, I, you know, the, the, I kind of bucked and said, okay, I'll help you with this one project. And I helped them with that one project. And I really enjoyed it. And I also enjoyed the profitability of it. Because of course, as an employee, I never really saw that if I did a, uh, if I, you know, put together a deal and the company made $30,000, then, uh, you know, I received a piece of that. Whereas all of a sudden, I just did this deal and I made the profit for me, for my business, for my family. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. So I understand that I'm taking risk, but the reward seems to be pretty interesting. And, and so that kind of, you know, expanded into the formal formation of a company. And then that company just continued to grow because one of my like clear, clear objectives when I started that company was to start a company that I could one day walk away from. I, I knew that from the very first day. So every time I wrote a letter, every time I created a document, it was saved and given a serial number. And so I would never have to write it again. And every time a new, uh, a new uh, role was created or a new uh, a process was created, I documented it, saved it, wouldn't have to do it again. So I knew from the beginning that my intention was to build an enterprise around me rather than a job for myself. And, um, and so I built that business up and we became a, an industry leader in the, mobile, uh, you know, in, a, in the mobile computing and data capture world. We branched out into the services and repair industry and that did very well for us. And you know, I, 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 after nine years, I ended up selling the business to private buyers. And that's when I really started getting involved in business speaking. Great. And, uh, you know, I recognize it so much that often enough, we stop becoming business owners out of the situation where there is no other way anyhow, right? Yeah. So, you know, where there's pressure and we just need to go forward, right? And I yeah. know that from back then, I mean, until today, you know, you have built quite a range and even sold a range of businesses. And today you're financially free, right? And I know that you're regularly on stage with Tony Robbins as well at his Business Mastery events. And I know there you're speaking about, you know, really how to go from being a business operator to be a business owner, right? And even here in Germany, there is a lot of people still, the majority of entrepreneurs is actually solopreneurs, right? But the question is, how do we step away from being a business operator to become a business owner? And how do, you know, what are the steps that you took that you advise, would advise our audience here to take to also make that journey. Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you that one of the great honors of my life really was when uh, I got the invitation to come and share business and marketing strategies, um, on, you know, at Tony's events because he'd been such a, a big influence on me even as a very young man. 
Um, and, and so what happened was I went from being a casual, occasional business speaker to suddenly I really had to step up and perform at a world stage level and, 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 you know, and, and got coaching from Tony on, Hey, you know, this needs to be better and this is great and that needs to be better. And, and so it was a really interesting time for me. And, um, you know, so I, I, I really value that to my, my, uh, um, I really value that time in my life. And, and so what I've really focused on now is that I'm in a position where, I, I recognize very much what it was like for business owners when they first started their businesses. And I remember what that stress is like. I remember what, you know, worrying about the cash flow can be like. I worry about, I, you know, I, I remember all those, um, you know, those, uh, you know, stresses from those early days. And so one of my great privileges in my life right now is that I, I quite often get to go out and, and stand on a stage or consult with somebody and answer some Time e might seem like a really simple little distinction, but to them in that moment was the key. And and I think one of the big keys to the whole question you're asking is, you know, how do we move from this world of what really is self-employment? Because most business owners are really just self-employed. They think of themselves as a business owner. They have a limited company or some sort of corporate structure. They get paid their salary from their company. They may even have, you know, a number of employees and plant and machinery and, and brands and websites and all this stuff. But the fact is, is that if they have to be there every day, they're still self-employed. And so I think one of the very key principles in building a business that allows you to move toward uh, true business freedom is knowing at the beginning that that is your plan. Knowing that. You know, uh, I remember years ago hearing Michael Gerber from the E-Myth say that the biggest mistake that an entrepreneur could make would be to start a business in, around their own passion. And I agree with his intention. I agree with what he intended by that, by that statement because it's, what he's really saying is, look, if you start a business around your passion, you will be in the business always. And so you'll be trapped inside the business. I would just take that statement and I would just twist it a little bit because frankly, I've had many businesses around my passion as long as that I also had the discipline to build a business around it. I mean, imagine, and I'm sure many of your, many of your fans and many of your followers, they're going to say, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have a business that ran like a business around me and allowed me to live my passion? So for example, if I was a dentist, wouldn't it be cool to have a business where all I did was dentistry because I had a passion for that? Or if I was an accountant that all I did was the accounting, I didn't have to do my own marketing. I didn't have to do my own HR stuff. I didn't have to handle the legal because I had a business. And, and there's so many advantages to doing that. Like for example, one is what happens if something happens to you? You know, well, great. I mean, not great, but, you know, if suddenly you need to take time away, their family emergency, a big vacation you want to take, you want to have a business that can survive that absence. And so knowing at the outset or making a decision at some point in the evolution of that business that you truly want business freedom is really the first step. And then to me, the, the next step after that is really neat. It's really simple. We teach something called role maps. We don't use organizational maps or, or, or organizational charts with our clients. We use what, what are called role maps. So what that is, is is taking an explosive view of the whole company and all the roles that happen within that business and creating what looks like an organizational chart just around the roles. Then, then we'll particularly sit down with the entrepreneur and say, now, let's take a look and, and, and see where you are. You know, what, which of these roles are you currently doing? Because what many people find is they quit one job to have freedom. And then they find out instead what they have is self-employment with 14 jobs. They have to do their marketing. They have to do the, the uh, strategy. They have to do the accounting. They have to do the business planning. They have to take the garbage out. You know, they're doing all of it. And so when you create that big role map, what's really cool is to then take a look and say, all right, fair enough. I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. Now, initially that might be very over for some people. Instead of thinking of some grand exit strategy, instead what you're thinking of is a series of what we call in our business freedom programs, mini exits, leaving one role at a time. Yes, great. These are important steps um, to really take. I mean, you're perfectly right. The first is to be committed to actually, you know, build a business around what you do and uh, bring it down into these roles is a very, very important step, right? Yeah. And, you know, and still a lot of people still struggle with that, you know, even when they've gone through this analysis and they said, okay, now I know which, which roles I want to pass over to someone else and want yeah. to have other people to run. How do they now build the bridge to really be able, you know, to bring other people on board? That is a very critical step for a lot of the people that we are working with, right? 
So, so this is where it starts to get really fun. And, and by, by fun, what I mean is that I have routinely at our seminars around the world or in one-on-one -on -one consulting environments sat with an entrepreneur and had them tell me, well, yeah, Eric, that's fine. I'm red. I see I'm red in that box, but I, I'm not coming out of it. I'm going to keep doing it. And so, so what I then have to take a look at is, first of all, why do they believe they have to stay in that box? And generally speaking, they have one very good logical emotion. It's still an emotion, but it's a logical emotion. And that is usually they have this belief that they have to stay in that box because they're better at it than anyone else, that they need the sense of certainty that goes with them holding on to that role. But there's a fundamental lack of honesty in that because here's, here's the way we do it, right? And, and I'm sure you I know I've done this, but you have, but it goes like this. When comparing who could do the job better, we take ourselves, so I would, I would take me at my very best and compare it with a new accountant. Well, you know what? Me at my very best is better than any new accountant. That's just the way it is. But that's not a fair comparison because, hang on, I don't enjoy doing it. So if I don't enjoy doing it, I probably put it off. And then I put it off and there's a deadline, so I end up rushing my way through it. So now what I have to do is say me at my reality against the new accountant. The new accountant's the better one to do the job. And so there's a small psychological shift that sometimes people have to make to do that. So that's step one. Another step, and I, I, we could go a little bit more deep into that, but I think that gives a good overview. Um, another step in this whole thing is to take a look at how exactly does that job happen? How does it happen? Because what, one of the things that happens so often, and again, I'm certain you've heard this time and time again, particularly for people just beyond startup. I really need help. I'm so busy. I can't believe it. I'm stressed out. I have all this email. You go, well, you should hire an assistant. Oh, I wish I had time to train an assistant, right? So, so people are so busy, they can't even hire somebody to help. Well, so one of the things they do is you take a look at a given role that you one day want to get out of and you document that role. So I, I, since I'm picking on accounting today, let's pick on accounting. So what that would mean is, okay, I, I have to raise invoices from time to time. How do I do that? Step one, open the accounting software. Step two, pull up the client. Step three, click raise an invoice. Step four, format the invoice like this. Step five, save the invoice as a PDF. Step six, pull out the invoice template and email it to the client. There are the steps. Now you have an A4 or you know, letter size piece of paper and that piece of paper tells anyone how to do that job. And you do that with that, with how to enter bills in the system, with how to pay the bills, with how to produce the profit and loss statement, with every role inside the accounting department. Now, when you bring in that accountant, and listen, I know this sounds really basic and everyone listening to this probably goes, well, of course I should do that. But are you? You know, and because now here's why you do it. When you're ready to bring that person in, what happens is you sit down with them and say, this is how we raise an invoice. I'm not going to show you. It's right there on the sheet of paper. You're going to do it, and I'm going to stand here and answer any questions you have in case the instructions are not complete. You have to show them for five minutes. Five minutes in, they're raising invoices. They know how. You can't complain about not having time to train them. And then there's the last step, and this is the illogical emotions. And this is the toughest part for most, is the illogical emotions, and that is that there are emotional needs that we get satisfied by doing certain roles in our company. And we don't even know we're doing it. In other words, like in my case, I have a weird way with computers sometimes. I just have a, you know, I, when I was a, a kid, I was homeless for a time. And one of the ways I kept from being on the streets was I negotiated a deal to live in a video arcade where there were video games everywhere. And so I got really good at video games and as a consequence, really good at computers. So in my company, I would be the one that people would call to say, hey, come fix the computers. But eventually that was taking a lot of my time, so I got an IT manager. But here's what got interesting. I would be walking through the sales room, for example, and one of the salespeople would say, hey, Eric, you gotta come fix my computer. I bet you can't, it's so broken, I bet you can't even fix it. And then I would go over and I would fix it with two or three clicks and then everybody in the office would go, oh man, like, you know, because they were like kind of wondering if I'd be able to do it. And I realized that because they were paying so much attention that I was getting significance out of being so good at fixing the computers. But I'm paying this guy over here $50,000 or 50,000 pounds, it was in England, a year, and I'm doing it because I'm getting some cheap thrill from it. But we have stuff like that all over our lives where we do things because it gives us a short-term emotional boost even though long-term it's bad for us. We do this with food, we do this with relationships, and we do it in our businesses. And so what I had to do that day is figure out a different way to satisfy my significance. And one of the things I did is I realized I felt really significant when I could say to one of my staff members, look, you and I, they go, Eric, Eric, I bet you can't fix it this time. And I go, look, you and I both know that I could fix it. 
call team manager. That's what he's here for. And then I got my significance out of having a business big enough where I didn't have to fix the computers anymore. So I think it's a much deeper conversation, but I think those three keys can give somebody a big head start. Right, and it's so, so many powerful messages. And Eric, I'd love to talk more about your time being a homeless as a kid another time. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a lot of uh, insights you gained at that time. Um, and I know it's, it's so funny that, you know, even in private life, we naturally delegate everything we don't like, right? So why do we stop it as being an entrepreneur? You know, I mean, it's yeah. crazy, right? And you naturally did it, as you said earlier, even when you started your first business, you documented all the different steps and then you pass it on to someone else. And that's what got you where you are today, right? It was, and there's one other really key thing about it. And that was that one of the reasons that some people don't like to delegate things away is because they're nice. And what I mean is, is that like, look, if I'm sitting here with all this accounting to do and I, and I hate doing it, then why am I going to go to you and say, hey, could you do this thing I hate doing? And so it's very hard for us sometimes to remember that other people like doing the other things. Like there are people out there that love accounting. I mean, they truly love it. I, I wonder if they're okay, but they really love it. And, and they love it so much that when they're finished doing your and my accounting, then they go buy Sudoku books and do something. You know, so, so when we begin to realize that there's someone out there that loves doing your accounting, There's someone out there that loves doing the HR, hiring and interviewing and review. There's someone out there designing marketing. There's someone out there. I mean, there's someone out there that loves every part of your business. And how much cooler would your business be is it if every role was being done by someone who loved doing that role? Right. And I'm sure that you and my accountant are doing pretty well doing the accountant for us, right? So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I love how you explain that. And, and Eric, I mean, you were born in South Africa, I think, right? And you That's have... Right part for nature and adventure and I know you're also running these amazing you know leadership programs every year as so you at the top and some of your friends uh, our common friends have been with you on that journey and they, they loved it um, you know why don't we you know a round of our our you know uh, conversation looking at you know what are entrepreneurial principles by comparing you know what are similarities between climbing a mountain and building a business so what would, would you say about that there are so many and and i'll tell you you know so what you're talking about is our CEO at the top program where where every couple of years we take a group of our key clients up kilimanjaro and spend two weeks in africa doing a, a leadership program and it's really fascinating so so how that was born was that as i was uh, um, designing our programs i realized that very often what happens with programs is people learn things theoretically But then when it comes to actually applying them, it's a whole different thing. Whereas if in the program they got to practically do things, then the knowledge was ingrained kinesthetically in their body. And so I, I was thinking like, you know, there's some things that we want to teach around leadership and communication and mental toughness, how to manage your state of mind. And, and I, I mean, we can teach all this in a classroom, but I'm telling you, we could teach people all we wanted about mental toughness and how to control their emotions. And 15 minutes later, somebody would be complaining about the air conditioning. So I thought, you know, what I want to do is, is create a, an environment where people can really learn this stuff in a, in a kinesthetic deep way. And so we decided that climbing a mountain had so much similarity to like a week of climbing a mountain is almost like a year of your life. And the truth is, it's very much like that. A week of climbing Kilimanjaro, every emotion that you have in that week is the same exact emotions you'll have in a whole year. And so it creates like a, a really nice sort of petri dish or experimentation uh, of mental, of, of human psychology. In business, it, 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 to your question, it's really simple. Like here's some examples. One is, is that very often in business, we have to be focused on something that seems to be different than what the immediate goal is. In other words, you're walking up a mountain and sometimes you're not walking up, you're walking down. It's just how it is. I mean, it's really frustrating. You're walking down and you're like, I just came up all this distance and now I have to walk down to get up. And sometimes business is like that. Sometimes you're going to have a moment where you're going to have to go down for a little while. The sales are going to fall off or you're going to have to change your focus or take on new projects or things aren't going to go exactly the way you want it to and you're going down. The key thing though is to keep moving forward. Except that sometimes you even having moving the other way. There, I remember, I mean, many times we've been climbing up and jogging and, and then okay. Why are we doing that? Because sometimes taking the direct path is the dangerous path. Sometimes taking shortcuts, you know, get rich quick, dangerous. And we go that, that way, but it's that way, right? We, you know, we need a quick rock climbing. Whereas if we this way, we just walk. So there's a lot of examples of, of, of how great physical challenges like that will teach us things about business. 
uh, you might know I'm really heavily into kiteboarding. And, you know, may maybe some people don't know what kiteboarding is. It's, it's kind of like wakeboarding or snowboarding on water but with a giant kite in the sky that's pulling you across the water, right? And I love doing that. Well, one of the things I found is, again, it's full of metaphors. It's full. It's like when, when you learn how to kiteboard, one of the key things is that you, if you're going to go upwind, you want to go upwind and not end up five miles down the beach, sometimes what that means is you have to look exactly where it is you want to be going. So if you're watching the people down the beach here, that's where you'll end up. But you need to turn your eyes up to the destination you have and sometimes even further up. And then you end up where you wanted to go. But too often in business, people are so busy looking at what is right now. They're looking at what the circumstances are right now and not keeping enough of a vision on where they plan to go. So I'm a big fan of people taking on physical adventures and journeys because it will help them to see their business in, in, a, in, a, in a more productive light. I love it. And I think it's so important, really, you know, to keep your eyes on where you want to go. It's just, you know, we cannot remind ourselves of keeping our eyes on that goal again and again, yeah. you know, yeah. direction and so on. Well, you and I, we keep our eyes also now on the next step, meeting in, in uh, Copenhagen at the Elevate, right? Yes. Um, and uh, you're going to be on stage again, being one of our sparkling speakers again. And, uh, you know, can you share with our audience just one or two messages that you're going to bring and share in Copenhagen with all of us? Well, I, you know, I think the first thing I have to tell you is I don't often do events like Elevate. Like, it's not really my mainstream thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I often view these, you know, you see these big congresses with so many speakers and, and, and you know, I, it's just not usually my thing. And, and um, and then uh, when, when, when I was first asked to speak there, my answer was no. And, and then I ended up speaking to some of my friends that had spoken at the conference before. Uh, you know, I spoke with Jan Datwood and some others, and they're like, oh, Eric, it's fantastic. It's like a Woodstock of, of, of personal. And it's not like a, you know, you're not up there for 15 minutes or half an hour, and then it's just all about selling your book or whatever. It's like you get to teach. You get to share. You get to really empower people. And so then I got to this like, wow, I really want to do, uh, I really do want to go. And, uh, and so in the end, I, I, I managed to get myself another invitation and, and I accepted it. And I can tell you that aside from my own personal events, of all the third party events that I did last year, it was really my favorite, most fun event. Uh, you know, many times if I do have an event like that, I'll go do my talk and then I go home. Um, in this one, I stayed for the entire three days. Uh, I hung out. We had VIP dinners where we were like hanging out with many of the guests on a regular basis. And it was really like summer camp uh, more, than a, more than a conference or a business conference. So I, I'm a big fan of it overall. And that's why I'm so looking forward to it again this year. Um, we're, we're working on a couple of different things that we're going to be presenting this year. One thing that I'm very excited about, I spoke about it at Elevate last year. And initially, my, my comment was, well, I don't want to do something that I already did at Elevate. And because something like 70% of the people that go each year immediately buy tickets to go again the next year. So, because that's how good the event is. And, uh, but then when we got out and started polling the audience, they were saying, no, we want to hear it again. We want to go through the steps again. So we will definitely be teaching uh, and showing and going through a workshop on inception marketing, which will show people very specifically how to increase their, uh, the number of prospects that are coming into their business, how to convert them more effectively, and how to keep them as long-term clients without increasing their marketing budget. We'll show really effective ways. I'll demonstrate it right in the room, as you've seen me do before, where people can see instantly the power of a good inceptive story, a story that can take non-buyers and turn them into buyers. And these days, most people with all their fancy SEO and sales and so on are just trying to attract buyers. But when you consider that buyers are a tiny little piece of the market and non-buyers are the rest of the market, what if, what if we could figure out a way to get those non-buyers to become buyers? That's a, it's, it's a hundred times the, 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 the prospect pool. So we're going to be talking about that. And we're also going to be talking about business freedom, specific strategies on how as an entrepreneur to move yourself to a place where you are truly a business owner and not a self-employed business owner. It's a very different energy and we're going to share some strategies about that. And the other thing is, it sounds like we're going to be having a, um, a conversation about, uh, about public speaking, about, about really how to use the natural attraction that great presentation skills create for people. It's magical. When, when you take the stage in front of five people, 50 people, 500 people, 5,000 people, a very strange attraction gets brought into play, which can help grow any business, can help raise people's pricing, eliminate competitors. I mean, it's a very valuable skill. 
And there are two things that stop people from doing it. One is they're often afraid. And I, I, I know because I used to be phobic of speaking. And the other one is that they lack the skills. And so we're going to be showing people how to overcome that fear easily. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might remember from Elevate last year, I took pe two people up on stage and in, within 20 minutes, they're speaking to the audience. And I, I have, I've lost track of one of them, but the other one is out there speaking today. So, um, so we're going to show how to do that really easily. And then we're going to show some specific hard skills that people can use immediately the next week to go out and create attraction for their business. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the way you're describing it, like the Woodstock for entrepreneurs, I mean, I think everyone that's watching us, all the friends that are watching us right now, I mean, come and join us. It's going to be fun. And the way you're talking about what you're going to bring, honestly, it doesn't sound like a three-day event. It sounds like a two-week event or something like that. But it's <laughs> I, talk, I talk fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I really look forward to meet you there, Eric. And uh, we're going to share the link with everyone, obviously, as well, so that, you know, all of you that are watching us today don't miss this one in Copenhagen. And, you know, we are happy you said yes again the second time, Eric. It's amazing to have you. Um, so thank you very much for making the time today for this interview. I know you have your well-deserved, uh, you know, relaxation time back home right now. <laughs> And, uh, Don't you know, worry, it's all perfect. It's 11.30 in the morning here and the wind does not arrive until about 2, so it's not interfering with my kiteboarding at all. We're all good. <laughs> Great, okay. You keep your eyes on your goal, right? So, you know, <laughs> thank you very much for being with us. Are there any kind of last words of wisdom that you want to share with our entrepreneurs on what they should do to finally reach business freedom? You know, I will share this one thing. There will be hard days. Maybe you're having one right now. I don't know. There will be hard days. And one thing to really remember is that those hard days have a very strange way of feeling permanent. They have a strange way of creating the illusion of permanency. The hard day represents the future. And I want you to know here and now, it does not represent the future. It really truly does not represent the future. It represents a moment in time. And what you need to do is get through that moment in time because entre entrepreneurship is truly the ultimate expression of personal freedom. And what it means is, if you can control your state of mind, if you can deal with the risk, if you can deal with the ups and downs effectively for two years and just really focus and work well, then you can create a life for yourself that other people only dream about having and you don't have to win a lot in real. That's my message to you. I love it. Entrepreneurship is the ultimate uh, personal freedom, you know? I, I love these words. So, great. Wonderful to have you, Eric. So, for everyone else, I know you enjoyed this interview. So, join us and Elevate uh, in uh, Copenhagen in November. And for everyone else, we look forward to see you next week where we introduce another great entrepreneur to you. Thank you so much, Eric, for being here with us. We really appreciate having you. You're see very you. welcome. Thank you for having me. See you.